Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Emerge Even Stronger, Why Now is the Time for Healthcare to Accelerate Digital Transformation, sponsored by Workday. I am Molly Gamble, Vice President of Editorial with Becker's Healthcare. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. We look forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log in to today's webinar to access that recording. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Dina Kraft, Global Head of Healthcare, Go to Market at Workday, to begin the presentation. Hey, thanks, Molly. So, hi, everyone. My name is Dina Kraft, and we're excited that you've joined us today. Uh, I help to lead the healthcare practice at Workday, and Brian, Deb, and I have really been looking forward to today's conversation. Um, a few weeks ago, we had an opportunity to chat about all of the digital advancements that we're seeing across healthcare. Um, and so I'm delighted that both Deb and, and Brian could take time in the midst of everything that's going on to share their experiences with, with all of us. And so today we're just going to touch on the drivers of uh, the digital uh, transformation that we're experiencing. We're also going to talk a little bit about creating a digital front door and how our digital efforts in healthcare are supporting our overall employee experience and probably many, many other things as we get into the conversation. Um, so before we dive into the discussion, uh, Deb and Brian, I might just ask that each of you take a minute to introduce yourself to the audience and maybe share a little bit um, about your background and your role and also your institution. So uh, Brian, do you wanna start? Yeah. Um Good afternoon, this is Brian Lancaster. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology for Nebraska Medicine and the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, so if you're not familiar with my organization, we're a health network that covers the Metro Omaha area. We roughly have uh, thousands of doctors and, and nearly 40 clinics. And we're really known for quaternary care. Um, it, we, we did some initial work in 2014 with Ebola and that work kind of played into a lot of the pandemic um, we're supporting today uh, on, a, on a national scale as we were the organization who received some of the first patients from the um, cruise ship back in, in February. So really look forward to ex explain um, more about my organization and how we're approaching digital transformation. Thanks, Brian. And how about Deb? You want to take a, take a stab at an introduction? Absolutely. Deb Moreau. I'm the Chief Information Officer for El Camino Health. The last couple of years, El Camino Health, we had a journey to move from a hospital-centric organization to really focusing on our community, and, and it's really been something that's been very pervasive in our thoughts with our strategies and our approach. So I'm thrilled about the direction that our organization is going. We we're, are a hospital that uh, was the first hospital in the U.S. to have an EMR and a CPOE system back in the 70s. So we have somewhat of a rich tradition of innovation, which uh, we embrace. And then, of course, we are a few miles away from Apple and Google, and we actually deliver a lot of Google babies. So um, our <laughs> patients have a different expectation of healthcare, and uh, it, it really drives us to, to be better. I am a nurse, and uh, that moved into IT years ago, and I'm very passionate about technology and the clinical workflows and how they mesh together and, and really create a, a great difference for our patients and our employees and clinicians. Well, thanks for that, Deb. You know, as we chatted a, a few weeks ago, um, you know, Deb, you're in California and Brian, you're in, you're in Omaha and there, while there are certainly lots of differences between your markets and your locations, there's a lot of similarities in your agendas around an innovation strategy and a digital transformation. So maybe we'll start there um, and talk a little bit about the driving force behind digital trans transformation at each of your organizations and, and really if any of those goals of, or objectives have shifted um, as we're kind of navigating this new reality with, with the pandemic. Um, so Brian, I'll ask you maybe to start. Yeah, so, um, so we, we really embraced digital, I would say about uh, five years ago, and, and it was really on the the aims of how do we change the perspective of our our patients and stakeholders from that to where you go to when you're, where you're really really sick to you know how do we provide the complete wellness and um, um, care for your entire family uh, not just um, for quaternary and specialty care 
Um, so we embraced several things. Um, one of which was uh, doing um, kind of cloud-based infrastructure to make sure we could support anywhere, anytime workflows. We also started to use technology to do digital marketing campaigns and, and things of that nature. But then also, how do we how do we start to provide um, care or provide engagement in a different manner? And really, how do we fundamentally change what we do and how we do it, which is all enabled by technology? So we really started from you know, we are re-educating the market about how we can provide a, a whole plethora of services. And then when they would need to provide those services, how do they do it on an online channel? Or how do we also have online and offline experiences to leverage technology when they come into the organization to, to make sure they can get the care when they need it? Um, so we've been on this journey for a while now. And, and, to, and to answer your question of has anything changed, I don't know if anything has changed, it's just has accelerated. And I'm very thankful that we started um, when we did because we could quickly enable um, a lot of these workflows um, that we needed to for COVID. And whereas um, prior to COVID, we had built a foundation, um, but really you had to kind of wine and dine our physicians and other leaders to adopt those, those approaches because there was still a, a heavy dependence on um, physical. Um, so, so I think, um, our strategy has been there, but it's been accelerated and been reinforced by the current event. So Brian, thanks for sharing. And you and I had talked about the fact that we've really made kind of a decade's worth of progress in the last couple of months on some initiatives that have been in the works for, for a long time. Uh, and Deb, you kind of shared some of those same sentiments. But Deb, could you could you dive a little bit deeper into the, the digital strategy at El Camino and, and how, if at all, those goals may have shifted over the last couple of months? Absolutely. You know, our vision as an organization is to transform healthcare for the Silicon Valley, which is a really lofty goal, as you can, as I mentioned. You know, our consumers and our patients have, are many of them are employees of high tech companies, and in their world, mm. they expect healthcare to really match the world that they're in. You know, our goal was always to provide personalized, a personalized patient experience, and to provide care wherever the patient was or is. And, um, you know, our goal has been to develop a clinic of the future where we surround the patient with technology um, before they arrive at the clinic, during their clinic experience, and then when they leave, we stay connected to them so that they can see their health record and, and experience, uh, you know, really interact with their health record. And in our hospitals, we really were focusing on hospital room of the future where we surround the patient with access to their medical record in their bed. Um, and the ability to learn about their health care and to interact maybe with family members uh, in their room through a virtual experience. So we were on the track for all of those things pre-COVID. I think that the situation now um, where patients are at home and they're scared to come to the healthcare care uh, environment because, you know, they're hearing through, through different channels that, you know, sheltering in place is critical. So patients are living at home with, with very serious conditions, and we're finding, and you're probably hearing, that patients are arriving at the hospital with, uh, in very serious uh, conditions, and some of them are, quite frankly, not making it to the hospital. And so how do we take care of patients so they are not alone at their home? How can we reach out into their home environment through digital means? How can we chatbot with them? How can we interact with them? How can we monitor them? These are all uh, things that I think the current environment is pushing us quicker than we had imagined to deliver on. So that's really a key focus of our organization. And Deb, those, those components, are those all components of what you've um, referred to as this digital front door for El Camino Hospital? Absolutely. As we're, as we've been thinking about you know, if you think about uh, retail and you think about how does retail interact with patient with consumers, and they have a digital flywheel, many of them that they 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 are always interacting with their consumers. They're engaging them. They are encouraging them to to interact with their products and services, and they're rewarding them as part of that process. We were thinking about that in the fall of last year and how to develop that, and so we en enabled a, a mobile app. And our vision was the mobile app is a, an area, a place for a consumer or a patient to go and for us to learn about their healthcare needs and for us to deliver a journey or a journey map for a 
for a very personalized experience. And, you know, the first so, question that you always want to ask a patient or a consumer is, what are your needs today? How can we help you? And as you learn more about that, then uh, helping the patient understand what's the next step for them in their care. Is it that they need an urgent care visit? Is, um, is it that they need a virtual care visit? Is, do they need a visit with their primary care physician in the clinic, or do they need to go to the emergency department because there's more serious conditions? So the mobile app initially is to help guide the patient with their immediate needs, and then to start educating and delivering to them um, a personalized experience for their very specific um, healthcare condition. And so we, we develop journey maps. And so for maternal child, um, the goal is to help at, at the moment that they are, we find out that they're going to be a patient deliverer, then we, talk, we provide an app through the mobile app to help them guide them through their pregnancy. Uh, then we also help them, you know, sign up for different classes and educational opportunities. So the mobile app, the, the, our digital front door, is almost a meeting place that serves up apps to the consumer based on their specific journey. Uh, it's very unique, and we're excited about it. So, so Deb, you, you made me think about this personalized experience in a different way, just hearing you talk about um, the, the, uh, what you guys are doing at El Camino, right? So we often hear about a personalized experience, thinking about common journeys, but the piece that you added around asking the patient about their needs that day um, really does get to a different level of personalization, right? Because if I'm, you, you could have created a journey map on what it's like to be an expectant mother, um, but my needs as an expectant mother might be different than, than another expectant mother's needs on that day. So I think that, that just gives, that opens up my mind a little bit differently to, um, to how I've thought about a personalized experience before. So thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Um, maybe we switch gears a little bit. So, so Brian, when in our conversations, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the the patient experience and the consumer experience, was at, which is absolutely important. Um, but you've talked a lot about how um, Nebraska Medicine is using emerging technologies to improve the employee experience, so that. Uh, the employees can better serve um, patients in the community. So can you tell us a little bit about those initiatives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so as I, I was mentioning, some of the work we were, we were doing um, for digital, we really started about uh, five years ago with a vision to provide anywhere, anytime access to IT services. And what we really meant by that was, you know, work wasn't where you go, it's what you do. And if you're a, a physician who needs to do some charting at night, it should be easy for you to do that at home. If, if you're an accountant who um, may be at a conference and you need to do something on the system, you should have access to everything you need from a smartphone. And, and really that, that entire uh, experience and, and, and allowing for that um, elasticity really could drive change and, and transform our organization to be more agile. Um, so, so we really looked at um, several things, one of which was how do we have a cloud infrastructure of a private data center that could uh, you know, serve up mobile web and um, legacy systems all on a variety of different devices, corporate devices, uh, personal devices, laptops, desktops, tablets, et cetera, and so forth, as well as provide access to uh, as, as close to a similar experience as possible. So just giving access to systems was, was a first big push and making sure IT can um, enable that um, on an automated basis. And then it really came down to the workflows themselves. And if you could imagine, um, several of our workflows were very manual. Um, so even if you had access to um, IT services, those manual processes wouldn't be enabled through that. So, so how do we really start to digitize and automate our business processes, business workflows, et cetera, and so forth. To, to many extent, if you look at where we came from, we spent a lot of time on the clinical workflows with our uh, electronic medical record adoption, and we got some great wins and have some great digital experiences. But, but our business processes were aged. Um, you know, when I, when I first started, I, I would carry around requisitions I had to review and sign, and people, if I was traveling, would have to fax them to me. Yes, fax them through my to my desktop. <laughs> I'd have to, you know, 
you know, sign them and all that. It was a dreadful process. And then also any receipts I would have would be accumulating for travel and in, in my, you know, my billfold and I'd have to give them to my assistant as a, as a very manual process, which could take weeks, if not months to, to um, digitize and pay, let alone analyze and direct. Um, so really we're looking for how do we get that same kind of innovation that we got with our electronic medical record for our other business systems, ERP, et cetera, and so forth. And, and I think that really gets into adopting, you know, cloud-based SaaS systems that not, not just provide that great user experience, but also allow us to have standardized best practice workflows that we can hardwire across the organization. So now all sides of the business, clinical, as well as the business support areas um, have um, workflows that are automated. And, and I think that component with the access is really starting to drive a lot of interesting change. Um, and you know, the old adage of, geez, it would be nice to not spend 90% of your time getting information and then only 10% trying to manage. Now we have all the information we need automated and now we can start to actually manage it. So 90% of the time of, of leaders is spent on, on problem solving versus information gathering, which again, I think is, is transformational of, in and of itself. Right, and so important in, you know, in today's environment where we don't have a lot of time to, to gather data and spin our wheels. Um, you know, I think there's also a lot of beauty in, in the journey that the organization has been on first on, from an EMR perspective and then, you know, it's been in more of the administration side of not only providing access, but like simplifying um, those processes along the way. And, and I have to give you and your team a lot of credit, Brian. So um, as we were having this discussion a couple of weeks ago, you were, it was the day before your Workday Go Live. Um, and so your team has been dealing with uh, the response to the pandemic on top of a, a pretty significant implementation of Workday across HR, finance, and supply chain. Um, so can you maybe talk about the, the decision to uh, continue the implementation and to pivot virtually and what that virtual experience has looked like um, on, a, on a truly transform, transformative project. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I wish I could say um, on March 12th, we decided to, to get everyone home, buy everyone laptops, and to do all these projects remotely. <laughs> and and the, fact, the fact of the matter was, this was part of our strategy and plan for a long time. So if, if you rewind to where we were, um, and a lot of the drivers for anywhere, anytime IT services was really the, the sheer fact that our academic medical center is running out of space. And also just the acknowledgement of for IT or other um, administrative uh, services type roles, do you need to physically come into an office to do your work? Um, so, so we started adopting both um, virtual practices and um, the controversial open office practices, you know, probably earlier in that, the, you know, a year or two before that. So we had been working on kind of enabling this, this uh, work from home, if you will, for a while um, and, and kind of getting the processes and, and some, uh, some of that work underway. I, I think if I remember the timeline correctly, we kicked off our Workday project in November. And I remember having the kind of uh, hard meeting during the pandemic or the start of the pandemic on should we continue to do our Workday implementation when we can't get into the room together, and, and we made a what I thought was a bold decision of no, we should continue to do it. Our support partner can work from afar. Um, our our teams are are equipped and able to work remotely, and you know what? We didn't miss a beat, and it's very proud of that fact. It really, it really I think justifies and and shows that this work from home movement could sustain going forward. Um, I also, um, not to toot my own horn, but I think you should know, we, we also executed a um, Salesforce project for a contact center. So a key part of our digital health strategy is how do we provide that personalized experience with a mobile app and when you, when you come into our clinic, but also when you call into our contact center, have that personalized experience. And, and that project is going on uh, from a, a, a virtual basis. We did a sell point um, implementation, and we also did um, a, a epic, an epic upgrade all through this um, time period. And in addition to 
you know, setting up drive-through clinics and new care venues for um, expansion and surge, new, you know, tents and, and all of those sorts of things we are um, underway of, of with as well. So very proud of the fact that we were able to respond so quickly. It does make you wonder what we were doing before, because if you would ask me <laughs> for March 12th, I would say, wow, we're really busy. There's no way we can do all of this in such a short period of time. Um, and when, when we drilled into that as a leadership team, it really came down to having clarity of priorities, which is, as I think most mm -hmm. of us understand, is an agile principle. So if, if the whole organization is telling you, you need to get the surge tent set up in a week, you can rally the troops and you have a whole team focused on that. And, and I think having clarity of priorities of what to do and maybe more importantly, what not to do allowed us to move very, very quickly. So now we're looking at a leadership team uh, broader than just IT on how do we have those processes that allow us to have this is the highest priority. You're not going to stop doing that until you're done and then move on to the next priority. Because what we've seen is by having that focus, that really that clarity alignment and focus is really enabling a lot of work to be done in a short period of time. Yeah, and you know, I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper on that, maybe um, in a few minutes, just how do we keep the momentum going? But you know, you, first of all, congratulations to you and your team. That that is a, a seismic effort on a number of fronts in the midst of a pandemic, and. Um, you know, there's nothing like a, a common, clear objective to get everyone aligned and to move mountains. And, you know, we talked about just, you know, if you look at, at work from home or telehealth, you know, those were those were topics to get a lot of momentum on in healthcare for, you know, the past decade or so. And virtually overnight, or certainly within a couple of weeks, um, on both fronts, we've stood up you know, incredible infrastructure to be able to deliver to patients through a virtual environment and to have our employees work virtually. And so now I think the question is, what does what does the future state look like, right? What tenants do do we keep? What things do we shift? What do we learn from other industries that may have had, you know, work, work from home kind of arrangements for a while? Um, so Brian, you lived through kind of putting this doing a lot of implementation um, at the same time of, of responding to the pandemic. And then, Deb, if we shift to your experience, um, you know, as a CIO who had, had implemented a lot of the, the back office um, cloud infrastructure as a Workday customer, um, can you talk a little bit about what having that, that infrastructure allowed you to do? Yes. We, you know, it was interesting because we were on an old, um, old, old product that was not upgraded or supported. And, you know, so moving to the cloud-based product in Workday was just a life-changing experience for us because we were now on a platform where upgrades are going to happen on a regular basis, that new features are going to be served up, that we knew security and, and all sorts of um, elements that we needed to, to run our business were going to be provided to us. And so that's exciting, and we've really benefited from that. So the immediate need is just staying on an upgraded platform uh, without, without distracting my team dramatically was so critical. You know, and then as Brian mentioned, self-service has been, you know, just uh, really life-changing as well. And in other words, not having, having your work list electronically so when you move to remote work, employees can take care of requisitions and invoicing and, um, and and evaluations. We're just doing performance evaluations right now on Workday. And being able to do that wherever you're located it has been critical for us. And one very specific uh, really benefit for us is we were looking for an employee symptom, symptom monitoring tool uh, for the COVID situation. And the value of having Workday uh, send our people information over to SailPoint, which uh, Brian has also has implemented as our identity access management system, and then sending that over to our ITSM product, we were able to build an employee symptom tracking system very rapidly that stays up to date based on Active Directory and then is able to send notifications to our employee health and to our management team when employees are experiencing symptoms and need to have a work change. So that has all dramatically helped us, not only pre-COVID, but now in the middle of the COVID situation. 
Thanks for sharing that, Deb. And you know, you, you and Brian have have talked about uh, the organization's priorities and objectives, and then and then what the last few months have have looked like. And you know, we like we said, we've had a lot of progress in the last couple of months on a lot of digital strategies that were already underway. So maybe we can shift gears for a minute and and talk about. Um, where we are today, what do those you know key objectives look like for you maybe over the next year and and how how are you keeping that momentum going with you know alignment around the organization? So Deb, you want to start? Yeah, I you know as I think it's so important for the CIO role to be at the table uh, at the strategic table and hearing, where the organization is wanting to go, what what's the real mission, vision, and you know um, objectives and tactics, and then what are the pain points? I spend a, you know I, I really value um, interacting with key stakeholders to understand what's working well, what isn't working well, and then providing those solutions to um, to those around us. You know as we're going into as we're all experiencing some financial challenges with COVID. One of the key ways to deal with that is reducing applications and really focusing on those core applications to run your business, which you know Workday and, and our ER, our, um, our other applications are providing. And so, how we can find, um, be able to resolve solutions using our core applications is so critical. And I, I think be, having that knowledge of our current features and functionality that are available, and then addressing pain points really does, I think, help support the organization and keep everyone aligned for the future. That makes sense. Brian, anything that you would add? No, no, I think that was um, well said. The, the only thing I would maybe just uh, add would be, um, how do you really make sure that you can kind of keep the pulse in a, in a dynamic changing environment? Well, one of the things we found was um, you know, kind of calling to order a, kind of a HICS structure, so a hospital incident command system, where it, it really changed from a typical incident in terms of if it's a, a fire or a natural disaster, you basically recover very quickly um, or respond to it and recover very quickly. Whereas with a pandemic, this just became an ongoing process. We really started using those daily meetings to talk about what we need to, to um, support this and treat this pandemic which got into you know, how do we launch telehealth, how we sustain telehealth, how do we you know, get equipment, and all those sorts of things. And I think that type of structure really allowed us to get the clarity on what the priorities were. And, and again, that provided us the, the quick turn on, on new projects. So thinking about how we get that going forward, I think will be important for us because otherwise we'll, we'll go to a, 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 an approach that will be based on multiple different committees and um, then trying to reconcile and um, sequence across multiple committees to come up with a, a unified sequence prioritized list takes a lot of time, which <laughs> then doesn't create that agility. Uh, so we're really thinking about how do we do that at scale that allows for us to understand the true needs, you know, top and down the organization, as well as provide that agility. Yeah, the agility and speed, right? Like um, that, uh, in a in a quote unquote normal environment, alignment takes a long time. <laughs> so, so how to how to you know continue to accelerate um, the you know the laser like focus for the organization on the work that needs to be done um, will be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, we maybe have one last question before we we go into our audience questions. And um, actually, someone submitted uh, a question around budget and finances. And Deb, both you and Brian mentioned just the financial realities of of today's healthcare landscape. Um, do you have any advice that you would offer on advocating for investments or thinking through investments at a time when there is so much uncertainty on the on the financial front? So Brian, maybe we'll stop, start with you on this question. Yeah, I said, so first I think Deb's strategy with application portfolio management is, is spot on. So how do you continue to consolidate and get value out of technology deployed um, can certainly help um, minimize costs and, and get economies of scale. The, the other thing I, I would add to that is, is really looking at not necessarily the cost of technology, but the value you can get from the technology. 
and I, and I think this is where it becomes key. And, and this does, I think, in my opinion, get to the essence of transformation. Meaning if you buy technology and it, you deploy it and it supports really the same processes that you've always done, that's not transformational. Um, to me, transformation mm -hmm. is how does this enable something new? So if we, um, so we have an initiative called Digital Campus. So how do we teach differently the, the next round of medical students using augmented reality, virtual reality, and kind of flipped classrooms with online mechanisms for lecturing versus um, you know, in-person um, um, classes for lecturing. And they really uh, serve up kind of that in-person time for collaboration and labs and things like that. The same thing with digital workforce. Um, how do we really change the nature of our business and our processes to really enable something new um, and then obviously with telehealth, it, it really does become a game changer when you talk about, you know, healthcare really should be more about health and less about care in terms of, um, you know, if I have to go to a physician to manage my diabetes or other chronic illnesses, that's probably not as useful as if I can engage with a, a health system, a wellness initiative from my home, because that's going to likely be much more impactful to my lifestyle than coming to an office twice a year for 10, 15 minutes. So how do we really use technology to change? And I think that's transformational. So if you think about that in terms of cost, so how do you show the value of managing patients with chronic illness and, and changing the way you teach and, and, and getting more students engaged and excited about coming to your organization or just making up, you know, your, your workforce more productive through a digital workforce initiative, that's gonna be more valuable. It may have some significant upfront cost. And if you just look at the cost side of the equation, you may never launch those and therefore never reach that transformation. Um, so I think it's always about value. That's very well said. Uh, Deb, any, any comments that you would add? I would just say that, you know, nimbleness as we've talked about and flexibility is so critical as we meet with the county you know really um, instructions and guidance change on a daily basis and so how are you able to course correct you know based on new information I, I think the future for how we help our organizations to really get to a good place from a cost and financial standpoint is, is going to be about analytics it's going to end very much about predictive. You know, today we wait till yeah. patients come to our doors and we, and then we care for them. And how can we predict and, and use analytics from our EMR, from our ERP, from our um, productivity systems and staffing systems, do some analytics and predictive analytics to forecast and then to guide, um, you know, staffing and resources and, uh, we're, we're implementing a capacity management center right now that helps us guide patient throughput and, and all of those things and, and stay connected to patients. So I think the predictive is going to be really critical. And then what what are we predicting that COVID will be in four months or five months? You know, we're right now we're doing COVID testing for the community, but it, the value of that's not really clear of what value that provides. There's lots of discussion about serology testing and then contact tracing. And then on a mobile app, do you have some designation of where you're at in your COVID journey as a patient? Are you, you know, have you had the virus? Are you still susceptible? So I think being, I guess the message is being proactive through the use of analytics is going to be a key driver and I think enabler for our organization. Right. It's that, that predictive and proactive piece that marries up, Brian, with the point that you were making around really focusing on prevention and well-being versus sick care, right? And and to be able to do so, you you have to have that predictability piece. And um, there are so many questions right now about COVID and just, you know, healthcare in general that that certainly those insights, but but I would offer also collaboration. Um, so conversations like we're having today, and I'm sure conversations like each of you are having with your peers on a regular basis just helps make all of us a little bit more informed and, and better prepared. Um, so, so Deb and Brian, I'm going to switch over to questions. We've got a lot that have that have come in, and um, there are two that we've two questions that have come in that uh, touch on topics we were just discussing. So, so uh, the first is around change management, and I'll, I'll we'll address that one second. But the first, uh, Brian, you you 
started to define uh, transformation uh, a moment ago when, when, you know, I think to kind of paraphrase, you said, you know, taking our existing processes and, and putting them on a new system is not transformation. Um, so the question here is on a similar note. Um, how do you define digital transformation in a way that physicians, executives, and board members can understand and allocate the right resources um, and double down on this journey? So, um, so adding my own words, digital, digital transformation is a lot like employee experience or patient experience. It, it can mean a lot of things to, to different people. So if you're thinking about how to get all of the right stakeholders on board to double down on digital transformation, um, how are you thinking about it and talking about it in, in your organization? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a, a great question. Um, and, and, you know, I think to build upon some of the earlier comments on the digital front door and, and focus on value, when, when, when I think you're, you're, you're trying to create um, kind of this, this call to action, if you will, I, I do think you have to create a sense of urgency. So, so why, why is digital transformation important? And, and I think then it, it fundamentally gets into, okay, what are, what are market dynamics and business drivers and, and why is this so critical? And I, and I do think it comes down to the, the nature of healthcare is changing from acute care illnesses to chronic illnesses. And the, the way you treat those types of, of conditions is so important and, and, and different than um, treating, you know, say a strep throat, right? Where you go into the doctor, they give us a prescription and you're, you're cured basically um, for diabetes, obesity, heart failure, et cetera, and so forth, it's really about lifestyle. So I think when mm -hmm. you're talking to physicians, boards, and other senior leaders, yeah, I think telling a story um, and then how digital transformation will support that story as it relates to the um, pretty well understood dynamics in healthcare, which fundamentally gets to um, increasing cost, poor quality, mainly due to what I was just mentioning, which is the rise of chronic illness and the cost to treat chronic illness and the ineffectiveness of traditional healthcare means of managing those diseases. So telling that story. So one of the stories that we did, which I think um, got a lot of excitement around our digital health initiative was, you know, how do we tell the patient's journey using both uh, a online and offline um, metaphor to show how those, those journeys, if you will, to use Deb's um, statement, really start online of how do we inform them of something that we can do? How does that then create a personalized plan for them that maybe starts with a video visit? And then as an issue um, progresses, they come in for treatment that's augmented through, a, through their technology or their smartphone to give them turn by turn navigation directions, helps with pre-visit information. And then when the physician and nurse sees them, creates that personalized care um, you know, by name, mentioning hobbies, um, all those personal relationship things that really create engagement with the organization to when they go home and now are managing a, a chronic illness of those health and engagement reminders that quite frankly is not something that you've tr traditionally thought of from a healthcare entity, especially a healthcare entity like ours, which is quaternary and specialty care, right? So how do I eat better? How do I stop um, maybe doing bad things like drinking and, and um, smoking and, and how do I exercise more? You typically don't have those conversations with your doctor. And I think digital health has such an important role to play in those types of engagement strategies, remote monitoring strategies, that then creates this kind of ecosystem for online and offline. And if you can tell that story in a way that's personal and uses things that physicians, board members, and senior leaders can understand, um, on how that can help with um, value-based arrangements, population health, um, all these, these important topics in a very real manner, I think then they get bought in and they start not saying, well, why do you need this much money for IT? And they start saying things like um, my CEO who just asked me, what do we need to do to make that digital front door swing wide open so we have this seamless online experience? And I think that's a game changer which only gets into the value proposition, that narrative, and really telling that story to create that sense of urgency. 
I loved I love that example that you gave around care really switching from you know an episode like a, a strep throat to chronic conditions and and I appreciate the audience's question around digital transformation um, because it can be a little bit of a, a nebulous um, a hard to define word and it can encompass everything from you know automating your or, or implementing an EMR to uh, having a website to developing an app or whatnot, but at the at the heart of it, and particularly for I would imagine for physicians, it's this understanding that um, you know our patient has changed, and in, in order to care for that patient, we have to engage with them in a different way because th these are long term issues, long term relationships, and not only have consumers' expectations changed, but if we don't engage in a different way, we're likely not going to. To, to make any um, traction against the, the chronic issue that they have. Um, I might, I'm gonna come back to change management. I said that was gonna be next, but I think that the, this conversation is a good segue, Deb, into um, a, a related question around your digital front door initiatives. And we have an audience member who has asked uh, how long the digital door has been in place and what kind of patient feedback have you received? And are there any lessons learned um, from this initiative that you know, if somebody was looking at a similar initiative that you would advise them to maybe to do differently or to think about that, um, that, that, that the team didn't? You know, as we started down our digital front door journey, and the goal was really to stay connected to patients and to, first to connect to, to our consumers or patients and then to stay connected with them. And so we started over, I would say, a year and a half ago, I had reached out to uh, one of the high-tech companies in our area and said, want to develop a digital front door, would you do that with us? And so we formed a relationship and were, used a, a partner of theirs to develop, the, uh, to develop the first iteration of our digital front door, which, you know, was fairly primitive, quite frankly. And now we're in our second iteration. So we've been at this about a year and a half. Uh, we, we're now in our second iteration where we've added virtual visits, we've, act, we've added internal wayfinding, we've added more journey maps, and I'm now partnering with our maternal child leader to develop our, you know, really build out our maternal child um, uh, journey. But it is hard work. Um, those of us in healthcare, we are not good at developing software. And developing software is hard, <laughs> hard work. And so, uh, you know, I would say, you know, know that up front, that when you are developing software, you're out on the skinny branches, you're out where others have <laughs> never been before, um, and you're developing things that are very new to the market, although I think we learn, we can learn a lot from those in the retail business, as I mentioned, you know, if you look at your um, texts that you receive every day, we, I receive lots of texts from retail organizations wanting to connect with me on a daily basis. And I think we in healthcare have that opportunity to connect to our consumers and our patients on a daily basis. And so I think we did involve our patient advisory council to give us feedback. Um, marketing is a key part of my initiative because they have the pulse on the on the consumer. And so I think I would just say it we started a year and a half ago. It's a journey. It's a hard journey, but it's so worth it. And um, when I see, when someone gives me feedback that, wow, that's transformational, then, you know, all the challenges are worth it. Isn't that the truth? I mean, just knowing that you made an impact in, on a, in a patient or a family or an employee, um, like you said, all that hard work is worth it. So I think we might have time for one final question, um, which happens to be one of my favorite topics. So one of our audience members, an audience, if we didn't get to your question, we absolutely will circle back and, and make sure that uh, one of us um, address your, your question. But uh, the topic that, that I feel so strongly about is just change management and governance. And so we have an audience member that's just asked how you've incorporated change management into into your uh, larger initiatives, whether that was a, a workday implementation or a telehealth deployment or, or whatnot. Um, so Brian, any can you start and just tell us a little bit about how you guys think about change management in your organization and if you follow a specific methodology or um, any lessons learned along the way? And this could probably be an hour discussion in and of itself. Yeah, so, so 
it's a it's a huge topic and, and generally speaking we, we use the Cotter model of you know initiate plan manage reinforce um, so so I won't kind of go through those steps in detail assuming there's familiarity with it um, and it, maybe just speak on some lesson learns that we, that we see with change management especially in an era of rapid change um, and I think the most important thing um, is anytime you introduce a new change um, be willing to accept feedback and react to that feedback. Um, so meaning that uh, all change in all plans may be um, well intended, but when you actually implement them and it may not hit the mark, be willing to make some, some changes appropriately. Um, and then also I think the real secret is how to know when to hold the line on an initiative or a change that may not be popular because the old way was the old way and the new way is just different. So you have to kind of tease out, um, you know, when it's a, a valid change versus when it's, it's just um, someone um, providing um, maybe not helpful feedback. So, so I think that gets into kind of the, the last step, which is the reinforcement. But instead of probably more traditional approaches to change management, making sure you do have some adaptability based on trial and error and feedback. And to be honest, I think that's where we're at right now with um, some of our, our telehealth initiatives um, that were so rapidly implemented. Um, so we went from having uh, enabled telehealth, but only using it, you know, two, three, four percent of the time. And now, you know, we had a, a spike of, you know, 100 percent of our visits for a time period were virtual. And then now seeing that come come back to the, the middle of the road, you know, 50 50 um, sort of thing but really understanding where it's failing, both from a patient or a consumer perspective of, you know, do they know how to do it? Do they have that knowledge? Or from a physician perspective of maybe a, a standard that we had needs to be modified to be more conducive to their practice needs or to the, the needs of the patient. So I guess just being open to that adaptability. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Brian. And I think, um, didn't you mention to me the other day that that uh, you guys have seen an increase in patient satisfaction scores with the use of telehealth? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, that was correct. So we, we use um, Prescani um, as our form of collecting uh, feedback uh, from patient satisfaction, feedback from patients. And we have seen a, a 7% increase for virtual visits versus in-person visits. So I think that's that's significant, um, and, and really looking at you know again how do we continue to maximize it. Um, so why I was mentioning that you know some of our um, quick adoption has has left some rough edges to providers and and maybe some cases with, with um, patients. That's generally on the initial appointment or getting established a connectivity um, issue or an install with the app issue or something of that in nature. And once they have that visit, they are seeing a higher satisfaction level, which to me indicates that we need to continue to, to adopt and build on it and, and then really to start to maybe just in, in build this into our, our normal processes in terms of, you know, maybe a first visit is for a primary care physician. Maybe that always starts as a virtual visit um, or something of that effect. Yeah, and I, and I bring that up because I think it's fascinating and for anybody in healthcare that's um, on the line, I'd love to hear your experience if you've seen something similar with, with healthcare and patient engagement. I haven't seen a ton of research on it yet. But I also think it's an important part of change management, right? Like measurement of anything in terms of outcomes can, can maybe help the, the next initiative or to validate um, an initiative that you may have just worked on. Um, Deb, anything that you'd offer around how, how El Camino is, is, uh, um, looks at change management or addresses change management? Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, we uh, implemented, um, I always love technology where you implement and there's uh, quick adoption. And um, one of the tools that we implemented based on a pain point that patients in our ED would sit in the ED for an hour or two and not know status, not know what the next step was. So we started texting our patients in the emergency department to tell them, Here's where you are in the process. Here's the next item, like your lab's been drawn. A doctor will be seeing you in five minutes. And that was adopted. The clinicians loved it. The patients loved it. And we do measure that in Press Ganey 
And we had a 75% adoption two months after we implemented that of patients saying they did want to have, receive text in the ED. And then our press Ganey scores, we ask about that technology and we have received really positive comments. So I love technology that, that when you implement, it's easy to implement and there's easy adoption and it's just intuitive. You know, my thought on change management is really different. And, you know, how many times does Apple ask you, you know, if the change they're going to make on your iPhone is acceptable or okay? They don't. <laughs> they, just, they just implement. And I think in healthcare, we are so conservative. And I think our, we're going to need to be moving quicker and sending out changes and, of course, correcting and, and, and making them better through feedback. But we've got to be very aggressive with, providing those features and functionality that are going to help our, our, um, our constituents, whether they're patients or clinicians. And we're, we're moving in a direction where we take features and uh, versus going through a very evolved change management process. But then we do receive feedback and check in and really look at adoption. Adoption is, a thing, is an item that in, the, in our IT organization we've really started to focus on because that really tells the story of that technology. Yeah, you know that we talked we talked a few minutes ago about the moment keeping the momentum going on the willingness to take on projects and um, you know I hope another silver lining is just the momentum of a of a willingness of an organization to adopt change right so we've we have been a little change adverse in the past and um, and you know I, I think that going forward we're we're probably going to be able to leverage some of what we've learned from this experience to to help accelerate future initiatives. Well, guys, I think that's about all we have time for today. Um, it has been such a gift to have this conversation with both of you. And so, Deb and Brian, on behalf of Workday, we, we thank you for being generous with your time and generous with your insight and learning. Uh, we really are all better together. Uh, so for today, we'll close by just reminding everyone that you will get a recording of this session. And we wish everyone uh, well. We hope you stay safe, take care of yourselves, take care of your teams, and thanks again for joining us today.